Hi, everybody. So today we have um, my friend Kara on. I'm super excited to have her because May is, you know, I, I really wanted to honor everybody out there struggling uh, with Lyme disease this month at the end of this month here with it being Lyme awareness. And so she's really the perfect person to have on here. Um, she's the regional leader for PA Lyme and Resource Center um, in Franklin County, PA. Um, and she's the secretary at Chambersburg Lyme Alliance. And um, she's also a rep for Pulse Center's high intensity PEMF systems. So she, um, and she's also um, dealt with, you know, Lyme herself. And she just has a huge heart for bringing awareness to this topic and really just bringing resources to people, which I totally love. So I'm really happy to have you here, Kara. Thanks, Holly. Great to yeah. be here. Yeah, so um, there's a few questions I wanted to ask you. Um, the first one, um, have my, I have some of my questions written down so I don't forget them and I need to pull them up. Okay, so basically, um, you know, here in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of people that have Lyme, there's a lot of ticks and things like that. So, um, you know, I know I've heard before in one of your presentations, like the growing population of ticks and things like that. So I know even just at the start of this season, we've already seen a few in our yard and that was like a few a few weeks ago and I'm like oh it's not even that that warm out yet so why would you say um like you know why is there so many more ticks now versus the ticks now have been they've been exploding for years and a lot of that is the population changes uh Pennsylvania was deforested uh decades ago and our forest has been growing back and we've been moving into them so we're seeing an, an explosion is in particular of the black-legged tick, which carries uh, the Lyme disease uh, spirochetes, the uh, Burdorferi spirochetes. So we're seeing not only the weather is getting a bit warmer currently, that contributes to the tick population, but we're getting out into nature more as well. So we're exposed to them quite a bit more. The CDC has been recognizing increasing numbers of uh, cases of Lyme disease because of it. In fact, they've, as of 2017, said that their previous reports were a tenth of what they should be. So there might be 20,000 or 30,000 reported, but there's more on the order of 200,000 or 300,000 cases mm -hmm. per year. Okay. So there's a lot more than actually we even realize. Yes, and, and a lot of it's due to the exploding uh, tick population. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So when we think about ticks, uh, what are like some classic places, you know, for, for our yard them up? Our house? <laughs> yeah, where, where should we be kind of like, you know, hyper-focused of avoiding them? So the one of biggest areas for tick populations is going to be in downed leaves. So they need moisture. So think about leaf litter, all the fallen leaves that might be uh, collected in the yard. They also are often found on tree trunks, fallen logs, um, leaning up against a tree or sitting on a fallen log are two of the most sensitive areas for picking up a tick, as well as when we're out in high grass. If we're on high grass and the ticks have gone up, uh, gone up the grass stem, holding on to it, waving their front legs, which is called questing. They're looking for a blood meal. They're looking to find us. So mm -hmm. if you've been out in those sorts of areas, do tick checks. Uh, always do check checks at the end of the night. Taking a hot shower, hot bath will help wash off any that have not yet attached. But uh, being outdoors, I would not avoid necessarily being outdoors. I'm a big outdoors person myself. And I picked it up from through hiking the Appalachian Trail in 2005. We didn't know anything about hardly as hiker population. The community didn't know about Lyme disease hardly at all. But what you'll want to do is um, beware of when you're brushing against high grass or leaf litter. And of course, use permethrin on all of your clothes that are gonna to be touching those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to get up towards the end and grab that bottle it's right over there so I can show I've got one right over here too. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, you can show them, yeah. Let me know if you'd like to go into it now or a little bit. Yeah, in a little bit, we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, so like I know in our yard, um, when I'm, when you're talking like automatically, I'm like, oh, we have a fire pit 
which means we have a wood pile. So yeah. <laughs> places like that, um, yeah, we don't really have, so that would be. Firewood's, firewood's another uh, very sensitive area for picking up ticks if you're carrying firewood around. Mm -hmm. So like you said, wood pile's a, a prime place to pick up ticks. And if you're, if you're vigilant, if you keep doing good tick checks around your body, chances are you'll, you'll catch any that get onto you. But uh, being aware of those areas, being aware of shady areas, for example, if you have uh, kids and play, playground equipment in your yard, a lot of people will put it under the, the shade of the trees, but that's much more likely to be an area to collect ticks. So if you trim back or move the playground equipment to areas with direct sun, you'll have much lower likelihood of, of uh, collecting ticks in that area. Okay, so that sounds simple. That sounds, you know, like a plan. I, I feel like sometimes when we have kind of like a plan of what we can adjust, yeah. it makes us feel a little bit better, so. And there's a lot about these resources on uh, palime.org as well. If, um, if you'd like to look at more comprehensive uh, suggestions for keeping your yard a bit more tick safe or for preventing or uh, for treating Lyme afterwards, uh, palime.org is uh, the best place to go for Pennsylvania suggestions. Okay, cool. Um, so what are, um, what are some symptoms? I mean, I know we know about, you know, the bullseye rash, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't. And, it actually yeah. happens a lot less often than people think. Only to about a third to a half of a time will anybody show up with a bullseye rash. When mm. we were through hiking the trail, we only knew about the rash. If you had the rash, then you have Lyme. Otherwise, you're fine. Not true at all. Mm -hmm. Half or two thirds of the time, you're not even going to show with the rash. You won't even see the tick. So you might think, I never saw a tick. I never had one attached to me. A lot of times, the ticks can attach, have their blood meal, and drop off, and you never know what happens. So if, if you start getting joint pains, especially knees, a knee uh, starts hurting or gets inflamed and large, that's a prime sign of Lyme disease, of an acute infection. If you start getting a stiff neck or headaches, especially in conjunction with joint pains, those are, are big, uh, uh, big red flags that you might wanna get it checked out. It can also go quietly unnoticed, like it did with me. I personally didn't have any idea I had Lyme. I didn't get the flu symptoms that I know of. I didn't really get the joint pains. Of course, I was hiking, you know, 10, 20 miles a day. So you have joint pains anyway. It might have just been masked. So yeah, it's easy to brush it off and say, it oh, is. it's sore from hiking or, yeah. or whatever. In fact, or I was just growing pains. Yeah, like I was just telling you, my, my daughter, she just came down with Lyme. And we are pretty vigilant, but we never saw the tick. And she started getting a sore knee. And I thought at first, oh, okay, growing pains. Or she banged up her knee playing because she's really active. But then she started getting ankle pains and hip pains and then a bit of a headache. And in the course of a couple of weeks, I thought, oh, ho, this, this we need to test for. So mm -hmm. tested and there it was. She came positive with Lyme disease. And we miss it in kids because a lot of parents think, oh, that's just growing pains, not a problem. But if you get roving joint pains, it hurts here, then there, then your toes, then your ankle. It's a very close sign of Lyme disease and it's worth checking out. So that happened over the course of like a couple weeks, everything was mm -hmm. kind of getting worse. Yep, a couple okay. weeks to a month. Okay, well, that's good to know. And especially like in the summer, mm -hmm. like when you're talking about like like sore neck or feeling like tired or like flu like things like because you don't really get the flu very much in the summer so exactly. that would be a good um a good thing mental note so yeah. um so let's say that let's say your child comes in and they're like mommy I got you know I got something on me and they have a tick on them mm -hmm. what is the safest way to remove it so I can start with the safest ways to not remove it, because a lot of okay. people think, let's burn it with a match, let's drown it in some alcohol or essential oil, but you actually don't want to do it that way. You want to remove it with sharp tweezers, because if you irritate the tick, if you put um, an irritating substance on it, it can have um, a reaction such that it will uh, output, let's say output, there's a 
<laughs> grosser ways to put it, it <laughs> will <laughs> toss out the contents of its stomach or can and uh, inject more Lyme spirochetes into your body. So there's a lot of the common ways you don't wanna do it. So if you, if you don't remember exactly what I'm about to say, if you get a tick implanted, just do a quick look up and find out about using tweezers. So pointy tweezers like these ones. Okay. So you can get in underneath the head of the tick, right close to the skin and very slowly pull it up. You wanna be able to do that so it backs out its mouth parts and doesn't leave part of its head. If it does leave part of its head, it's not a problem. It'll shed that off. You don't need to get it surgically removed or anything, but it is better to have that out so you don't have the ongoing skin irritation. So you take the, the pointy tweezers or you can get specific tick tweezers like these tickies ones are very good at doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a number of other tools out there. They all work pretty well, but I usually like the pointy tweezer method. Pull it out very slowly. You'll wanna put it into a plastic bag and save it. Because in Pennsylvania, we're very lucky to have at East Stroudsburg University, free tick testing for Pennsylvania residents. So you'll pull it out. looks like, there we go. I freeze every so often, I think. So you'll pull it out, put it into a baggie. It's got at ticklab.org. Again, that's ticklab.org. Follow the instructions in the baggie. I believe it says to put it in with a damp um, cotton ball, send mm -hmm. it to them and they'll do the basic tick testing. The earlier you catch it and remove it, the less likely, of course, you are to have it, but they will ID the tick. If it is one that you're able to ID, if it's a larger one, you can go on to any of the Lyme sites and see if it's a black-legged tick or a dog tick or a groundhog tick. If it's a black-legged tick, you might want to talk to either your doctor or if they're a very conventional doctor, you might want to seek out one that is a integrative or functional medicine doctor because um, the science is still catching up to our standard medical profession, uh, professionals. A lot of them don't know the breadth and depth of Lyme uh, issues and may not do testing that will actually catch it. Um, so again, pointy tweezers or tick tool, lift it out slowly, put it in a plastic bag with a cotton ball, send it to ticklab.org if you're a PA resident and then uh, check into treatment options, which I think we'll be talking about next. Yeah, so when you so when you do it, you don't actually wanna squeeze its, its body. Because you do not wanna squeeze its body. Right. You wanna actually squeeze where its head is. And yeah, Yes, yeah. Okay. exactly. Okay, so um, how long does it take when you send the tick off in that little baggie for them to kind of get back to you? Usually about a week, it's pretty quick. Oh, okay. You'll wanna put, put some hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, some essential oil on that tick bite site as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, when we talk about, so that's testing the tick, but then testing ourselves or your child or whatever. Um, I know that this is really hard because there's just like a lot going on with what's the right test, what's not mm -hmm. the right test. So yeah. can you give us some reputable places that we would know to go? There are a lot of questions about it. The, the standard tick testing that's done through, say, Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp is called ELISA and Western blot testing. Unfortunately, they have a high failure rate. There's often a 50% false negative rate. They do not catch all the cases of Lyme disease. Spirochetes are crafty little things. The type of bacteria does not usually live a lot in blood. So they're looking for the antigens, um, the antibodies. So what it likes to do, the spirochetes like to get into our cartilage. That's why you'll feel it in joints. It eats the cartilage, creates inflammation. So for tick testing, uh, the best ones to go with right now are MDL laboratories, MDL. A lot of times that is covered by insurance. And the other one that is very well known is called Igenex, I-G-E-N-E-X laboratories. It's not covered by insurance, um, but they do excellent testing and it's worth the investment in one of those two laboratories, especially if you start finding the signs and symptoms and your doctor might not give you the, the treatment otherwise. Mm -hmm. I know with um, MDL, uh, Medical Diagnostic Labs, because that's the one that I had used, um, it's about, I want to say it was like 240, something Sounds like right. that. So yeah. it, it really wasn't, I mean, that is, you know, a chunk of money, but it wasn't. Astronomical. 
especially, yeah. you know, when you got enough. Compared to the uh, expenses of what might happen if you do have Lyme disease. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that's good to know. Um, so, so we know about testing. So how, can you tell us, share a little bit maybe about your story and things that you've used that have helped? Oh, wow, well, I've tried so many things. It is a long story that I will make short. <laughs> uh, so in 2005 is uh, when we are pretty sure I picked up Lyme disease because again, I was hiking for seven and a half months all up and down uh, the Appalachian Trail going north. Um, did not know for many years. For some people, we don't get the classic symptoms. Uh, it, it can crash your endocrine system. So you might show up with autoimmune diseases. In my case, it was autoimmune hypothyroidism. Had no idea that there was a uh, that there was a Lyme disease uh, component, or Epstein Barr, or any of the other um, Powassan, there's Powassan virus. There is Babesia. There is Ehrlichia. There's Bartonella. There are a lot of co-infections that might also be affecting health. In my case, I never showed up with uh, the traditional co-infections, so Lyme disease is probably what triggered it. I also had a mold issue, and I think you've had one too, huh, Holly? Mm -hmm. And Lyme yeah. and molds uh, are negatively synergistic. So if you have a Lyme dis uh, a mold issue, it's really hard to take care of your Lyme or Epstein Barr or other viral or uh, bacterial issues. Yeah, yeah, and especially if you don't know that you have a mold issue and you're living yeah. in a mold issue, and, and then that's what happened to me too. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So never underestimate um, mold. You know, well, mycotoxins yeah. really is what the yeah nasty guys. Did you know that uh, alcohol is basically a mycotoxin? Oh, I don't if you drink think about it. Stuff. It is. Uh, alcohol, <laughs> drinking alcohol, yeah. that is the mycotoxins uh, that are produced by the yeast. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. <laughs> there are some good funny. mycotoxins like penicillin. There are a lot of bad mycotoxins like the, um, like the ones put out by black molds, uh, aspergillus. Yeah. But without getting a lot into molds, suffice to say, if you have an ongoing problem, especially if you smell any mustiness, mm -hmm. it's really worth checking into it. And Holly, I bet you've done a lot of videos on this in the past. Yeah, I, we can I, totally I do a whole, mo a whole mold uh, video oh. or a whole mold week. <laughs> yeah, did you know it makes you, it makes you electrosensitive too? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. does, it does. But um, as far as things I've tried, they, the ones that have helped the most have been cleaning up my diet. I always thought I was fairly healthy our standard American diet, unfortunately, creates inflammation and Lyme disease itself, not the Lyme spirochete, not the bacteria, but what we think of as the effects of Lyme disease uh, are inflammation. It's an inflammatory effect. So reducing inflammation for me, it was gluten. I was told to go gluten free uh, 11 years ago now and thought I was just fine. But within a week, I lost 10 pounds. All of my belly was all inflammation. Mm. and reduced grains, got reduced the sugar, uh, never had been drinking much, but reduced that even more. And as we clean up our diet and go organic, for me, it was a, it was a huge game changer. It's simple, but incredibly impactful. Mm -hmm. And also um, one of the big ones that's simple and costs absolutely nothing is, was my gratitude practice. Mm -hmm. it, uh, in our day and age, we're starting to hear more and more about it and the physiology behind it, and I don't know if we mentioned it, but my background is in science. I have a master's in oh. physics. Yeah, I, I love getting one. into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love getting into why things work, mm -hmm. and when we think of gratitude practice and prayer and stopping for a moment for reflection, what we're doing at a physiological level is calming our autonomic response. We're calming our flight or flight uh, state. We're often stuck in the, what's called the parasympathetic state, which is fight or flight. And that's an inflammatory state because of the cortisol. When we relax, increase our, our feelings of gratitude and love towards the world, it not only has the spiritual component, there's a huge physiological component, which is probably a lot of the reason that we do it. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's so many different parts of it, but it physiologically calms that down and allows your body to rest and recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, um, there's actually a breathing technique. Maybe you, maybe you do this one, but uh, mm -hmm. it's called four, seven, eight. So I've breathe them. For, yeah, breathe in for seven, four seconds. Hold it for seven, and exhale slowly for eight. 
and yes. you hold it for seven, it stimulates that vagus nerve and calms you down. Yes. So it's you can cool. actually do a very simple measurement of how well it's working by measuring, how the, I'm sure you know of heart rate variability, right, Holly? Uh-huh, yeah. So you can take your pulse and feel it beforehand. And then as you start that four, seven, eight breathing or box breathing, one of the breathing practices, on the exhale, our heart rate variability increases. And what that means is when we are in fight or flight, our heartbeat is very even, bump, 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 bump. When we start breathing in and breathing out and going into parasympathetic state, our rest and recover state, our heart rate will increase and decrease with our breathing. As we breathe in, our heart rate increases. As we breathe out, it decreases. And that breathing out is our rest and recover state. And that difference between them as we breathe, you can feel it and know just how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And that's something everybody can do. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it doesn't cost a, a penny. So Exactly. And so those are the two, the, the simplest, well, eating change isn't exactly simple, but it's a lot simpler yeah. than uh, many of the other things. But I've tried everything from 10 pass ozone, which was very helpful, doing some UV, uh, UVBI ozone right now. Um, a lot of herbals, a lot of supplements, getting the right nutrition and whether it be through food or supplements, and of course, a combination doing um, heart rate variability training specifically with a, with a little app and, a, and a, um, a little device. The pulse center system, of course, not to uh, be tooting my horn, I work with pulse centers because I have spent tens and tens of thousands of dollars trying to recover my health over the last 12 years. And the pulse electromagnetic field therapy, whether it's pulse centers or any of the other ones out there, has been one of the biggest surprises and, and amazing modalities that I've found. Of course, being in physics, I love that it's pulse electromagnetic fields. So that's something you can find at a number of practitioners. Uh, again, many different companies, but it can help with the circulation. It can help with uh, assisting the body's uh, detox pathways and nutrient uptake. There are thousands of uh, peer reviewed university level studies talking about it out on PubMed. Um, so that's, of course, what one of my big focuses right now, but there are a lot of things that we can do to help our detox pathways. Sauna. Sauna is another big one. I have an IR sauna, which I love. Um, so I'd say those are my top uh, methods that I've used for uh, working with my Lyme, and it does still come and go. You have to be very aware of your symptoms, and if you have a stress in your life, they are very likely to flare up. Mm -hmm. So you go back into doing, whether it's herbals, if it's an acute in, uh, infection, I hate to say it, but antibiotics, mm -hmm. they work. If it's in, acute, you got to attack it before it goes systemic. And that's what we chose to do with, with our daughter. Again, I'd yeah. rather stick with herbals, but this, this bug is, is a bad one. It's a serious one. So it's worth doing the antibiotics and a long set to work with them. Um, an ILADS Lyme literate health practitioner who will do six weeks of doxycycline um, and some of the supporting ones as necessary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you really do have to. You have to do what works because it yep. can get really serious. So exactly. Sure. So um, I just wanted to talk. Maybe you could explain a little bit of science on what Lyme does to our cells because I know you talked a lot about yeah. inflammation, and we all know that we feel inflamed, yeah. but what's actually it, happening. <laughs> yep, it's creating an inflammatory cascade. It's, so Lyme disease is all about inflammation, whether that's in our joints, whether that's in our brain, because it can give you a lot of fatigue and brain fog, mm -hmm. in addition to those initial flu-like symptoms. And it can even happen in the heart and the organs. For example, the endocrine system uh, is very subject to, to Lyme disease inflammation. And heart, uh, if you start getting palpitations, AFib, uh, all out of the blue, that goes back to saying, what, what do we look for? Inflammation of the heart via the inflammatory cascade uh, can be one of those effects. And that comes about scientifically because of uh, what's called peptidoglycans. Mm -hmm. Big old word. So that one is the casing of the Lyme bacteria. It's the proteins that make up the casing of the, of the Lyme spirochete. And when it, uh, when it replicates, it sheds those. And then most um, 
most bacteria have an enzyme that will recycle that. So it can reuse it in the spirochetes, the Lyme spirochetes. Um, Borrelia does not have a, uh, an ability to retake up those, those peptides, the proteins. So the peptidoglycans get into our, our system and creates a kind of a signature, unusual sort of inflammation that's very characteristic of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And calming that down is, um, is the big area of recovery. Again, it's not the, the bacteria itself that's attacking us. It will get into our, into our cells, into our tissues. When we say it's a spirochete, that means it's got a spiral shape. So it will actually corkscrew its way into our muscles, to our cartilage, to our tendons and tissues. And as it replicates, it'll shed these peptidoglycans. And our immune system recognizes those as something foreign, attacks it, tries to deal with it with the inflammation, but it's a runaway system and we end up with pain and fatigue mm -hmm. and don't want to do that. So catch it early. Mm -hmm. so it's, all, it's just this massive inflammatory response happening yep. everywhere because your body's like, it's smart. <laughs> your body's exactly. smart. It's like, so what you can do to be there? Exactly. So anything you can do to support that inflammatory mm -hmm. uh, quieting and sort of cellular um, support that you can give it, like what you're working on, is uh, going to be of great assistance. Yeah. Yeah. I so appreciate you explaining all that and just sharing your, you know, all of your knowledge. So let's recap. Uh, you said the website for people is? It's PA, PA Lyme.org. Okay. PA is in Pennsylvania, Lyme.org. Okay. And we might want to mention that too. Yes. And then the spray. So this is, um, this one's permethrin. Yes. So you can put this on your clothes, but it needs to dry for two mm -hmm. hours and, um, make sure that you read the label and everything. If you have pets, um, I, I I'm pretty Be sure careful that they don't lick it. Yeah. If you have yeah. pets, it can do damage, but mm -hmm. use deed or lemon eucalyptus oil on your skin. This is excellent for clothes because it'll last through, I can see uh, uh, seven washings. washings. And so, it doesn't smell. It's completely odorless. It doesn't stain your clothes. It doesn't leave a residue. So As long as you don't spray it on your skin, it is benign. It's not going to do anything to you. Mm -hmm. So spray it on, let it dry about every seven washings, reapply it. It's a permethrin spray. This one is Sawyer. That you can find it in Outdoor stores, you can find it in Walmart. This is one of the biggest helps that you can get because this one, when the ticks get on it, they die. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that's really great. Like, yeah. so that's even more powerful than just, you know, repellent. Than repellent. Yeah, like the deed is a repellent, uh, lemon eucalyptus oil and, and the other essential oil mixes are repellents, but the permethrin will kill them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we, um, my kids, this even this weekend, um, they're excited to go out in the mm -hmm. woods and I, got their outfits laid out and they're all sprayed now they're hanging and drying so <laughs> but yeah so well thank you so much for coming on and guys if you know you're watching and you have any questions you feel free to comment below uh Kara's great mm -hmm. I mean she's a huge wealth of knowledge and thank she you. has such a heart for the Lyme community and she does a lot uh, to bring awareness and I so appreciate it so thanks thank you for coming on yeah well, my pleasure thanks for the time together this was wonderful Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, that's all we that's all we have for you today. But um, we'll be we'll be in touch. So we'll see you later, Kara. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.